You're listening to the Punisher Water Fowls, the Union 0430 podcast. Brought to you by Real Geese Decoys, the most technological advanced silhouette decoys on the market. And Vortex Canada, the force of optics. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Union 0430. This is episode 110, and unfortunately, you've got the three blind mice tonight. Um, we had a guest, but I'm thinking, I I think maybe because he's in a different time zone. Um, remember our conversation earlier, Phil, where you thought it was an hour later, and we were like, no, it starts at this time. I okay, think- I got all confused. Yeah, I think, I think maybe I might've done something and fucked it up, but either way, uh, you're gonna deal with the three blind, the three fucking, I don't stooges. even know what, three stooges, yeah. So you got the three Accurate. stooges. <laughs> Accurate. So you got Philly, who's on vacation up in Omimi. Are you we, up in Omimi? We, we are recording live from yep. Neil Young's hometown. Oh, excuse me. In Omimi, Ontario. And yes. Ryan- is in Nova Scotia, pouring a pint. Um, so here we are, episode 110, everybody. Um, and sometimes, you know, it, it it is good that we uh, that we just have us on because we get to to get some uh, get some stuff out of the way that uh, that we've been uh, pushing off to to talk about and stuff. So um, especially, I don't think we'll do another episode before early goose starts for you next week. Right, Ryan? Not it likely. Does. No, yeah, it does. Uh, on Thursday. So yeah, Mark is back on the East Coast where he belongs. Yeah. So population will likely take a greater hit now. And uh, yeah, we're going to get after him next Thursday and hopefully uh, it all comes together. The goose population takes a hit, but the sausage count in the freezer. I, I've already been instructed I'm going to need another deep freezer in the, in the uh, <laughs> garage because her current, currently, currently our, our original one is stocked full of uh, farmed meat. So I'm going to need uh, one for wild game. So, right. Yeah. 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 Off Nothing to Facebook, off the Facebook marketplace to search, yeah. for, to first search for a freezer. It's right. Make 40 bucks work for me as much as possible. Yeah, no, no doubt. But that's, it's a good sign, man, to know that, that fellas are start, going to soon start getting into the birds. Like I th- I'm pretty sure that PEI is on the same, same timeline as what you guys are. And then just as we hit the record button, Philly was, was saying up where he is, like, there's a lot of, a lot of birds starting to, to poke around. I was up in Ottawa Monday night um, with my daughter and the amount of ducks and geese that are in the fields uh, on the 416, Ryan, it's insane. Sorry, in- right, eh? Insane, buddy, what I've seen in the fields on Monday night. So um, the fellas the fellas that are hunting uh, Ottawa, Winchester, that, that corridor, man, you're in for a banger of a, uh opening uh, early goose, I'm telling you. Too bad you can't get at the ducks, but early goose you should be you should be good so um but i did want to talk about this because this has been popping up on my facebook feed for the last couple days um the numbers are down on i think it's on on teal teal is down um and i can't remember what else but i thought everybody this spring was was so happy because we had a great hatch out west the, the prairie potholes was saying this was a great hatch but um this week the 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 numbers came out and, and there's a few species that's that's down so i'm a little bit confused on exactly what happened there but uh you know you gotta go you take the take the word of the scientists i guess but it just seemed a little bit weird because everything was pointing to a great hatch this season and now we're being told different yeah, who knows? Yeah. Like, you know, it's still weather dependent. It's all geographically dependent, I guess. Obviously, you get better better hatches in certain areas than other historically. And yeah, but I think that's I think that's the same area though. I think they're talking the same area, right? Like I I'm pretty sure that like well, when when the Canadian Wildlife Service and and the American whatever environment or the 
interior or whatever it is down the states that manages that like that i think all they really concern themselves with is the prairie pothole region right like the dakotas and and minnesota and and down through there right so um yeah i don't know it's weird but uh i haven't seen a ton of ducks um but the geese are starting to move around here now so um hopefully well, i'm i'm starting to see them poker poke their heads into some fields around my parts okay like even even this morning so i took my kids up uh up fishing on pigeon lake and even like some of the fields i was driving by this morning at like 7 30 there was birds small groups like family yeah, groups yeah. whatever mm -hmm. but there was birds in fields and i'm like oh this is a good sight mm -hmm. oh p.s if, if anyone ever wants to get into a banger cormorant hunt go shoot pigeon lake yeah i got mm -hmm. i think i think i got you beat buddy i drove i drove over Probably. to sky no i drove over to sky pass um yeah dare to hamilton it, yeah. it was like it was like a a mob of of yeah. cormorants well, I, I had the uh had the, the, the fortunate occasion today to spend an hour out on the lake uh with one of our loyal fans mitch davis and we were talking about uh the cormorants it's like, yeah like going over that bridge like it's just black yeah yeah, it was yeah. insane, buddy. What I seen there on on uh, Friday driving over. Um, shit, I had something I was just gonna I was just gonna bring up. Oh well, squirrel mm, should have wrote it down. Yeah, I should have. I should have, but I didn't. Um, but we can talk about, and I, I would like to bring this up. And I know you guys weren't there, but uh, you you were watching your social media feeds and and you did see the stuff that I was posting. Um, I got to give a, a big congrats and and tip my hat to that. The ducks unlimited Grimsby chapter for, uh, for their first outdoor festival um, this past weekend and, and the dinner um, outstanding event. I thought it was an outstanding event. Um, I think they, they exceeded their goals of, of people to come through the the duck and goose call competition i think i was expecting a few more people to 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 sign up for it but again historically in canada um these calling competitions haven't given out the greatest the greatest of prizes so for uh for people to make that long drive to come to a calling competition for a uh, fucking duffel bag or or whatever you know there's not much incentive there but after word gets out of the prize pack for this uh for this week and i think next year there'll be they'll be lining up i i know ben ben heron walked away with two brand new shotguns i think 500 dollars cash a bunch of decoys uh, uh a couple prints like yeah it, it was a lot so so hopefully, nice. hopefully this is the cat. Hopefully that was the catalyst, and and this starts, you know, kickstarts this outdoor show in in Canada and or in Ontario at least, anyways, and and gets the calling competition back on the go. Like it, it would be good to see uh, fellows back doing it. So and and getting people back into to getting out and showing off their skills so anyways i wanted to give a big hats off to that to that committee because it was a fabulous event i had a great time i brought my son down with me he had a great time. the biggest thing and and i guess and you guys can chime in on this as well but you know uh i bring i brought my son around so he's 13 years old and so the majority of the people that were going to be there i knew them um they're friends of mine and we have beers together and stuff like this um but i was a little bit i was a little bit worried you know that you know my son was going to come down he was going to get bored and no one was going to talk to him and and he was just going to end up sitting there or or in the camper playing on his phone because no, he just didn't want to be out around with me or anything like that what well, a complete opposite happened um you know right off the bat everybody is you know checking in on him making sure he's okay um trying to get them involved and stuff. Uh, Rusty Heron and, and Ben Heron and Riley Heron, they they sort of kind of, they're over chatting with them and talking to them, add me on Instagram and and all this stuff. And now, and then uh, 
uh, Rusty uh, gives them a hat and a and a new uh, Heron SRT one call and makes them promise that he's going to learn how to do the call. Uh, so nice. now, yeah, so now he's up. Classy watching. is always Rusty. Yeah, Classy is always Rusty. Now Cade's up and listening listening to Rusty videos now watching Rusty videos on calls. Um, so he, he, he got, he, he started on his clock today and, and was doing pretty good. Um, but again, he like it's the Trish though, <laughs> <laughs> but again, like it, it was so refreshing to see that all these people like, um, Tim Smith and, and Trevor Davidson and all these guys, man, that just hung around and chatted with him. Like he was, you know, one of their buddies and and they never, never once treated them like a 13 year old kid. They treated them like just one of the guys and, and poked around and had fun with, especially Rusty. Rusty was relentless on them with the chirps. And, uh, and I, and he said, you know, dad, you told me I got, I got to be nice to, to my elders. And I said, well, it, the exception is Rusty because if Rusty's giving it to <laughs> you, you better fire back or you'll never hear the end of it. So you better be able to fire back at Rusty. So anyways, great event. And and I couldn't thank, uh, I can't thank everybody enough um, for how well they treated my son. So anyways, that, that's my spiel on that. Yeah, it looked like a good time. It was, like I said, when we were, before we came on, it was like one of the few events that I've seen that I was, wish I could be there. It looked like a good time. And I mean, on the the water fountain community in Ontario is greater than the Maritimes, and we don't see a lot of things and festivals like that this time of year out here. So it, it's definitely awesome to see that kind of get people in the right mindset that the season's coming. I mean, I, it always it always catches me off guard. I can't believe it's just next week, and I haven't done anything yet other than like drive around looking at birds. But um, it, yeah, it just never ceases to amaze me that first week of september it begins again so 100 percent billy how are you looking how are you looking for for early goose buddy <laughs> are, are you like i know you you've already got properties locked up and stuff but are you seeing birds on your properties already uh i've got i think i've only got one one wheat field this year okay maybe two um, I haven't haven't even given a thought about going by yet, um, but I'm, I've been seeing the birds. I've been seeing them in other fields, which I should maybe try to get those. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Question mark. But like they're uh, <laughs> right. Uh, but I've yeah they're they're starting they're starting to show like so like we got a whole pile of them here at the trailer park. They've been kicking around all summer long, and a couple have been sporting some some jewelry and. Ooh, some bling the, bling. the wife uh, wife's already put me on on point no you should be naming them ricky bubbles julian <clears throat> mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah. you should well, yeah like the trailer the numbers, parties, man yeah exactly the numbers numbers are looking good around my parts but we'll see once uh yeah once the big crops come down and see how things shape up but it's a sad sad day this year as i won't be hunting duck opener what a shame yeah, I got to work, and then I'll be heading out west, and then be heading to Goose Camp. So I'm like, you know what? I can probably miss this one duck opener. I don't like that what? attitude. The white. I'm coming home from Saskatchewan, and then I leave four days later for your camp. Yeah, hi, sweetheart. It was a great trip. Four days later, oh, gone again. <laughs> Just enough time to do laundry. Yeah. yeah. See you. Yeah you don't cause enough havoc in your house because if you did, she'd be happy that you're leaving. It's true. <laughs> yeah. In fairness, I got up at seven o'clock this morning, took the kids out on the lake for seven whole hours and they were troopers. Like I was the one that called it quits. Nice. And uh, the wife had, she went out to Coburg today, went with her, you know, out for lunch with her girlfriend. So she oh. had like a nice kid free day. So I'm like, yeah. You got compensated. Get those days in now. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, buddy. Yeah. It's, also, all, it's, it's all, all about strategic. Yeah. It's all about building yeah. up those brownie points, right? Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm getting up Friday morning at like four 30 and I'm heading to another lake to go musky fishing for the day. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Thanks sweetheart. Yeah, no doubt. And, and, um, and it's supposed to piss rain. So I'll be putting my, uh, putting my first light here to good use. Uh, so 
I don't know what's going on. Like we are, we're in severe, desperate need of some rain here where we are um, in Eastern Ontario, man. Like, like we we've had three solid days now of rain, but it's, it hasn't done anything to, to our ponds and our, our rivers and brooks and streams and stuff like that. Like we are, we need some, we need some rain, man. I'm t- I tell you what, if we don't, if we don't get some water, it's going to be hard to find those ducks. Um, yeah. well, or, or it's going to be easy to find them if you can find the big water, cause they'll all be in that big water, uh, somewhere. Um, they won't be, be like, scattered everywhere. Be like shooting fish in apparel. Yeah. But the- we had, we had a good rain. We had a good rain in my house all day Monday. Yeah. And then we've got, well, and like people know like we record this in advance so today's wednesday it's supposed to get some rain maybe tomorrow night it's supposed to rain pretty I think okay. pretty decent on friday but again like, had, i'm i'm two hours from you so it doesn't do shit for you yeah i know but like we've had we've had rain like we had, we had some like pretty crazy rain on uh sunday monday today is wednesday <clears throat> and and part of yesterday but still it's it's not enough you know what no. I mean? Like not nearly enough. I'm just, I'm just looking at, I'm going well, to look I had at. Con- I had concerns at one point of my dogs running too fast across my backyard and starting to fucking grass fire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, no. or, or frightened that they're going to tear up what little bit of grass you got left just by stepping oh, on Oh, there's nothing worse than I see like I, Thor walks out there and lays down a big fat mud monkey. And then he does like the. Mm. You know, tries to tries to bury it with what little bit of grass I got left as the kick up. I'm like, stop yeah. that. That's yeah. the only viable grass I own. Yeah, no doubt. Dog. No doubt. Um, boys, this is this is weird for us because uh we don't really have a guest or topics to talk about. And uh it's like I'm I'm my my head is just like spinning its wheels oh. right now trying and to any, total- any or any new purchases for this fall anything? yeah we're totally freestyling this yeah we are totally freestyling this um yeah. as for new purchase i i haven't got any new purchases because i'm mm-hmm. fucking broke um i i picked up the new first light ground control oh uh, did you get okay. it re- delivered buddy it- like three days yeah are you yeah, like it, it was stupid um i love it yeah it's and you the divider you'll use that for a camera bag right philly oh 100 like if i'm if i'm going, ever going out and doing a shoot and like i'm yeah. just solely shooting i'll put my stuff in that as opposed to lugging like right. my big nut my nut case right because it's got the straps it's got padding inside it's got dividers so you can separate like the body my big lens my smaller lens it's got some like well, if you guys go if you know for millions of listeners and viewers if you go on first lights youtube channel uh logan's done a couple of videos uh with a breakdown of the bag and such and like there's like pouches on the inside of the flap mm. that you can secure other small items in there like it it like unbelievably versatile mm-hmm. so it'll definitely right. be getting used as my blind bag and will definitely get doubled as a camera bag because it's waterproof again you can sit the thing down in water that's cool that's cool i know it's got i know it's got molly on the on the on the outside so molly yeah, or molly on, on whatever the, whatever you want to sides you of it to, yeah so that's uh that's pretty good i like i like that being an ex army yeah. guy it's, um, it's a slick bag i i need so i'm looking forward to that animator coming out um just because i want some motion on the water and i haven't made that purchase for say like the pulsator or you know higdon does the pulsator lucky duck does a couple couple different things they do a splasher and and stuff like you'll be getting motion and sound yeah so i'm 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 excited but i don't think those things are going to be delivered until october so i'll be a couple weeks i'll be a couple weeks into the ducks by the time that shows up and and normally for us we get a lull in ducks um, probably around the mid of October. Um, and we've got to wait then for, for probably three weeks 
uh, before we start to see any birds again. And that's only if it cools down. Like last year, we didn't see them until December last year. So I'm becoming that crusty old guy and I'm drawing the line with spinners. I'm not getting any more robotics after that. That's yep. as far as I'm going. Yep. Yeah. That's, yep. It's just too much. Mm -hmm. All this, I'll go jerk string or that's about it. Well, you know what? And that's a good point. You brought that up. Like I've got a jerk rig mm -hmm. and I've used that thing maybe once. And I, and I probably didn't use it properly mm -hmm. um, to its full extent. And, and you know what, that's a, that's a good point. I've got it. I just never set it up now where I, where I hunt for the most part. Um, I can't set it up, right? Because it's that loon shit bottom and, and there's nothing that's, there yeah. to, you know, hook on to. Yeah. yeah. I've got, what is it? The rigum, right? Yeah, that's the one I have to. Yeah, that's yeah. the one I've yeah, got. I've got the... comes in the, the little yeah. bag, the little mm -hmm. anchor, and the bungee. Yeah. Yeah. I actually I got mine off of what was it? Owen. What's Owen's last name? I have no idea. Lives up around. No I don't clue. Know I'm fucking blanking out. Anyways, I actually bought it off of him, and I've used it like literally once. Yeah, same with me. But, I've got it, but and and that's a good thing. That's a good point, Brian. Like maybe, uh, maybe it's time to dumb it down again, right? Kick it old oh, school. I'm not saying that they don't work. I'm not knocking yeah. the product. It's just not at all. Like, just it's my personal preference. I just find like, I don't know. I I like the work aspect. I appreciate it. And then just, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, spinning decoys are like the greatest thing in the world. But I mean, yeah, I just, that's where I draw the line. That's, yeah. that's my, no that's my max. No batteries, no batteries in a jerk rig. No, just uh, well, works every that morning. Buddy who, that buddy who you don't want to run the call because they're not really good. Like, hey, why don't you run the jerk <laughs> string? Today? Yeah, Aww. here, hold, oh, hold this yeah. and tug on it. Yeah, uh, hey, guess yeah. I know my job. Um, no, Damien, you're not the jerk <laughs> ring guy. Um, no, but I, I think, yeah, like that's something, and I'm sure, even though I'm in that loon shit, um, I'm sure. Um, there's a way to, to gear it up with, with a little bit of innovation. Um, you could gear it up so that you could still use it, probably use a, uh, you know, a stake, a down bigger truck. anchor, a yeah. Yeah, stake, yeah. longer line, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. I'm sure, I'm sure there's ways around it. You just got to get uh, creative with it. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, maybe that, maybe that is a good idea instead of, uh, going out and buying a, another motion thing, then something. I should invent something. If I was smart enough, I would have had it invented by now. I'm, I'm, buddy. I've got a job to tie my laces in the morning these days. So uh, without, <laughs> without twenty other things keeping me distracted, trying to invent something right now. Uh, there, oh man, there's a. Um, I can't remember the guy's name. I follow him on YouTube. Um, we should try to get him on the show. He's actually really, he's really pretty funny guy. Um, his YouTube channel is called Surviving Duck Season, and okay. yes. his, his name is his name escapes me right now. And he talks about he was, I can't remember how he got his hands on, but he got his hands on a spinning wing decoy um, yep. before they really came to market. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't remember which company; it doesn't matter. But and he talks about he tells the story about the first time they used one. And how they went to a spot and, you know, traditionally traffic ducks a lot. And they put this thing on the ground, they turned it on. And they're like, this thing is, this is not going to work. This is going to flare birds. Like the, the sun's hitting it, it's just bright and all that. And he said, they turned that thing on and there's ducks coming down from the heavens. Like they've never seen before. Like they didn't even need their calls. And they came from like, way up and he, he tells the story obviously in detail and it's pretty good but uh look it up and it just kind of shows you like sometimes innovation has a lot of you know a lot of good gains in it and sometimes it's like we've been talking about with uh when we had tangle free on but going backwards like sean yeah. stall like sometimes going back to what used to work back in the 80s and 90s to kind of refresh to throw a curveball to the to the birds 100 percent. keep talking boys i'm into something here right now <laughs> well i totally uh 
and I totally agree with you there, Ryan. Like, you know, you look, you look at, you know, certain, certain things phase out, new things, you know, come along and, you know, those products get, you know, the piss pounded out of it. And mm-hmm. you just take that step back and you simplify things. And it just, again, it's, it's that curveball to the birds and like, wow, like this is like something new and they eat it up or, you know, whether it's the type of hide, like so, so many variables and yeah. Work, yeah. It's out. like when, when my dad was goose hunting in like the late eighties, <clears throat> early nineties, like when he started, like they were using plywood, they would cut goose silhouettes out of, you know, three quarter inch plywood yep. and paint them and like they car tires and they, yeah whatever and they build and they build essentially panel blinds they you know frame up some mm-hmm. thinner plywood and put bungee on the front of it so they could strap you know brush or whatever they want and i mean here we are 2022 and what's the most popular thing on the market right now like guys are silhouettes are more popular now than they have ever been before yep. and your a-frame or your panel blinds are you know the number one way to hunt so it's just that full circle innovation if you will kind of thing fellas here he is he's come in to save the day oh we got uh, met- there he is we got mixed up on some times i told you boys i told you i screwed this up <laughs> there he is but, uh, there he is there's the himself. man Mr. Ira McCauley, Mr. Mo Marsh himself. I knew I screwed that up, Ira. The min- as soon as you didn't come on, I was like, I know I screwed something up here. Well, well I, I saw 7 o'clock, and I was like, okay, cool. So I came home and went up and down the hill trying to get ready for this elk hunt. Of course, my wife's gone. She's like, can you cook stir fry? I was like, yeah, I can get it done. <laughs> I fed puppies. And then I was like, you know, I'm just going to get organized and check that email link he sent me on August 10th. And I pull it up and it said, <laughs> uh, time. I'm like, oh, no. It's all good, so buddy. No, it's all good. You're, you're saving the day, actually, because the three of us were on here trying to uh, trying to keep the, the audience entertained. We're, just, we're um, just treading water. Yeah, we're treading we're, water like, an, like a six week lab. Puppy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Ira, I can't. Uh, so we've got Ryan. Uh, I don't know how it looks on your screen, but Ryan's down in the bottom left hand corner. And then up in the top left hand corner is Phil, who's who originally reached out to you and got you the uh, and asked you to, to come on the show. So thanks, buddy. Um, thanks for coming on. I know it's it's probably a little bit backwards the way you wanted to do it and stuff like that but um you're here yeah. nonetheless and uh and i can't wait to pick your brain on on some momer stuff so uh welcome to the union 0430 well uh yeah man um thanks for having me <clears throat> you know we've got uh, a little podcast that we do and uh but you know it's it's uh we're not near as organized as you guys are you guys have like <laughs> set up times and and uh and studios and all that stuff looks good well yeah yeah i i you guys probably got a little bit more on the go than what we do um you're you're a little bit busier so you know what ira like i went on the website last week and i i now i've been on the website a bunch of times before but i've never ever went on to the, the part of you know, the, the link about us and really dove into who Mo Marsh is and how it started and, and the video and all this stuff. Um, so first off, you're a doctor of vet- veterinarian medicine. So I had no idea you were DMV or DVM. Yeah. DVM. Um, yeah. I, I had no idea. So it sort of makes sense now with a lot of your um, dog centric uh stuff that you put out that that you are a a veterinarian so uh really cool so i was watching was watching the video that you guys got up on your website and stuff and it's you and your brother um you guys were originally you know you founded it and then you and your brother came together and you were putting the stuff out and and now you know you're you're aligned with higdon and power calls um it just really, really cool to to see from where you started in in the late nineties to to where you are today, and and to me, it just 
hard work and and putting out some some quality products um made it work for you yeah you know um so when i graduated from vet school in uh 1995 i became friends with a guy that that was a duck hunter that worked for the university extension system and we both liked to duck hunt and, and he was he was more of a tinker than he was. He was definitely not a killer, but he was definitely a tinker. So mm -hmm. he, he'd been messing around with fiberglass and uh, wanting to make like a little duck skip. Now, remember, back then there was no internet. So we literally had to go to the library and check out books on how to fiberglass. Mm -hmm. There's no internet. So you're looking through catalogs trying to find fiberglass materials. And I mean, you know, in today's world, people just have no idea how difficult sourcing information and materials was back then. I mean, it was Absolutely. just a challenge. You would spend so much time just trying to find stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and or, or you'd be like, okay, I need one of these. What is this thing called? And you might spend a week, you know, today you just type in black plastic boat thingy and, you know, search through <laughs> the images and you find it. But back then you had to get, you had to order catalogs from, you know, marine to industrial, mm -hmm. whatever, and then thumb through all the pages and hope you could find something. So it was way different and we had no, you know, no experience. So, and, and it was that way, you know, I just built boats from the late nineties until like 2010 and in 2010 around there, maybe 2009, uh, John O'Rourke who now works for, Momar Sigd and all that as the primary sales lead. He at the time was a head hunting buyer for Cabela's. And uh he called me up and he said, Hey, I want to uh have the Fat Boy DP combo in the Cabela's catalogs and stores. And I was like, you know, John, it's just a it's a terrible wholesale item. I mean, it's expensive, it's hard to transport, it's easy to damage and shipping, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's just a difficult thing to do. And he goes, you know, I really don't care because you have the best damn layout boat out there and I want it in my catalog. So we'll make it happen. I was like, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So th that was when I was like, well, you know, this, there's really probably a whole bunch more to this. So I want to come up with a line of products that are actually products that are good products. that would be a good fit that are needed in our community that do make sense to ship and solve the problem of aquatic mobility and you know dog comfort and hideability and just all the things that we've done so i literally sat down with a couple of pieces of paper and a pencil and came up with a wish list of like 15 items you know and, and mm -hmm. just pencil out what i wanted in the item where i thought there was a need and you know sketched out what i thought would work and uh, I did have the connection for a, a sourcing agent. Um, you know, they were making the Invisalign, which is a floating five position ratcheting uh, chair, like for layout blinds. We used them in our duck boats, but, um, or not layout blinds, but field hunting. And then we used them in our duck boats. And so I took the list to that guy and he was like, okay, well, you pick your top two and we'll, we'll try to start with that. So. I picked the Invisichair and then Invisilab, mm -hmm. and we worked on those. And then in 2012, I think, was the year that we launched those. And, uh, you know, I was new to the China deal. I was new to the import deal. I was new to the manufacturing deal. And, uh, you know, you've got, shoot, I don't know, $300,000 worth of product coming to your cost. And I'm like, oh, well, I hope. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, so when you said like the Invisa chair came out in 2012, like that was 10 years ago. And it doesn't yeah. seem like it was that long ago that it came out. It does to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To me, I'm just like, no, the Invisa chair only came out like five years ago, but um, hmm. you know, it, it, it's, but now like, so my question to you is, is this like, there, there's a ton of 
ton of businesses that that's in this waterfowl community industry, whatever it is you want to call it. But I I like to think that each each company, you know, th they're able to put their stamp on something. Um, that everybody goes, okay, listen, if you want this, you got to go, you got to go to this, com to company A. If you want that, you go to company B because they make the best. But like, like I use, and I've been using it for the, the dog, the dog ramp that I have on my boat is, is Momers. And I've been using it for, uh, I don't know, four or five years. Um, but then the Invisa, the Invisa, the, uh, for the dogs, the hide, the blind, Invisalab. Yeah, the Invi like that. I don't think anybody is creating anything remotely close to that, or to the to the quality of it. Um, now you could well, correct you know, me if I'm wrong, but no. I mean, I spent about twenty thousand dollars on a patent on that, so you know we've got some good IP protection, so they can't really, you know, they can't just knock it off without being, you know, running a bunch of risk of getting sued, right? And, uh, and, you know, it is a high quality product and it's hard Big for time. them to get close to it. Cause there's just, you know, the concept was so novel. I mean, look at our industry. We're a bunch generally, and, and I'll say this to any of my friends and or competitors, uh, in the space, but we're a bunch of copycats. I mean, you look yeah. at what's out there. And everybody just copies everybody else. Now there are, and, and hats off to people when they do come up with something novel and innovative that, that really um, moves the bar. But mm -hmm. in general, that's not what we do. So uh, anyway, the Invisalab has been a great product for us. I mean, it solved, you know, the problem of, of having your dog in the water, which there, you know, the, the, uh, the rough stand was already out there and people had been making homemade stuff for a while, but you know, nothing had combined a bind with a stand with, you know, the, the really easy and stable and, and uh, incremental adjustment stuff mm -hmm. like we have, you know, and so we just raised the bar a whole lot. And really what happened when I created that category of products was that we, made uh, a whole new category of items in our community because we really didn't besides layout boats i mean we didn't have uh, a hunt the x b mobile category of products that was out there like we did for field hunting so field hunting you know you had layout blinds um mm -hmm. and you know the there weren't really any mainstream a-frames you had guys that were you know building stuff out of chicken wire and and uh, all that like they still do but you know layout blinds were really the big hot thing and i'm so old i remember when layout blinds first started like before that we were hunting under burlap you know laying under burlap and there was no spinning wing decoy back then either you know so you were basically if you wanted field hunt you were goose hunting and you were either in a blind or you know, hiding next to a fence row or laying under burlap. Or it, it, it's a, funny. It's funny that you say that because just before you came on, that's exactly what Ryan was talking about. He was talking about his dad, um, how his dad, you know, they were, they were putting things together and, and working with fiberglass. Like I, I remember Ryan showing me the, the, the goose decoys that his dad made out of fiberglass. Um, so it, it, it's funny that everything is, you know, it's, it's coming back full circle and, and, I, and I get it. Like when it comes to the, the, you know, the panel blinds and, and the lay blinds and, 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 and it, it, it just seems, and, and just like what Ryan said earlier, like, it seems now like silhouettes are, are now the, the biggest thing, like people are all jumping on silhouettes. And, and so it, it's, it, it's always seeming, it always seems like it's coming around full circle. Uh, what's, what's popular one year, uh, 10 years later is now uh, on the back burner. And, and then you're going back to something that you used in the past. Uh, you know, would, would you agree with what I just said there, Ryan? Yeah, definitely. Like we were talking about earlier, just, I mean, there's always room for innovation, but sometimes what what's old is new at the same time too. And I think 
it's important uh, in the waterfowling game to think about where we came from and what worked then. Because if you're things that worked in the past, I mean, you can make modern tweaks and modern adjustments and reapply those to like today's with today's technology. And it's, it's essentially something new, even though the concept is old, um, like the panel blind or whatever. Right. And it's, it's kind of cool to see that kind of innovation through, uh, old, old style, if you will. Yeah. And I mean, let's just look at silhouettes for a second. So, you know, let's look at die bomb cause they're the hot thing and I'm good friends with Cody, but you know, that's a, that's a whole, through materials and uh, innovation and thinking about things a little different, you know, the old silhouettes would want, you know, there were USB plastic and the good ones were photo printed and USB plastic. And man, they'd curl up and they had a single stake and they were bent this way and they'd whip in the wind like crazy. And, you know, you couldn't get them in the ground because they had a big fiberglass rod. And so, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of improvement and silhouettes, even though it's still a silhouette, they're way more user friendly now than mm-hmm. they were back, mm-hmm. and, and look a lot better. I I wanted to to go back into into something that you talked about uh, first when you come on, Ira, and that was the fact of you know when you when you first started and you were making your 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 sneak boat or your layout boat, whatever you wanted to call it, um, and the fact that you know you were going to the library and you you had to order catalogs and and it wasn't this quick, easy, all the information was at your fingertips like it is today. And, and for, for the people that are listening and if, if you are of the generation where everything is, is Google and you can, you can get all the information that you want um, within a second, you, you really don't even, you can't even understand the pain that it had to be to go to the library to f- go through that friggin' drawer, that Rolodex to find out where the book was. Dewey it, decimal. The Dewey decimal system. Yeah. Like yeah. it was just, it was just a nightmare. And to be able to start there at like in the late nineties, you came out with the, the original fat boy, um, you know, that's, that's pretty impressive. And then, you know, to, to continually um, evolve to, to the point of where you are today with, you know, the Invisa lab and the Invisa, the Invisa chair and, and the dog products that you're doing and now the, the grass and, and everything that, that you're putting out there evolution. And, and I, this is a word that gets thrown around a lot is evolution, but to be able to keep up with the times says a lot about your your foresight and and your ability to adapt you know so like what do you see moving forward like how how do you how do you keep staying at the at the tip of the spear um yeah that that's the best that's the best analogy i can use I think right now is really a, man, it's a challenging time. So it's so hard to get things done right now because things are just so expensive. The tariffs are so high. Shipping costs are so high. And we're really struggling on like when it was just me and Uh, And times were different. So I'm not knocking anyone, you know, shipping was relatively cheap, but, and, and I could make a decision easy, yes or no. And the truth of the matter is, I mean, I wasn't rich by any means, but, but I would, I didn't need a product to make money. Like if I thought Mm -hmm. it was a good idea and I believed in it, then I'd pull the trigger on it. And my theory was always, Hey man, you know, if I can't get people to buy into this crazy concept, then I'll just sell them, you know, at my cost. And if I lose some money, so be it. Uh, I'll chalk it up to an educational experience, and move on down the road. But man, we're just struggling on the product development side. I mean, I've got some really cool, what I think are really cool concepts that I've been working on for years and they've been sitting in the pipeline and there's, there's a lot of people that, uh, have a lot, there's just a lot of challenges. So Mm -hmm. 
I really, there's, there's some things that I want to do and, and don't get me wrong. We've had some, some great, uh, achievements in the last couple of years. We had the Bursa vest, which is a big deal. Um, you know, one size fits all vest for your retriever and fits them correctly and properly for their body shape. And as they age, you can modify it, you know, from when they're a puppy to an old fat, big barrel chest dog. And then the Bursa bond has been really popular. You know, it's, it's way different than the other panel type blinds that are out there because it's got a skeleton that's lockable and stays in place and you don't have to have all these picky pixie sticks and connectors and then it's adjustable so that you can use it in the water and all that so you know those are two pretty big scores outside of you know some other stuff like bumpers and mm -hmm. different things but i don't know there's a couple big things that I've been pushing and pushing and we still don't have much traction, but I mean, these are things that are way out of the box. They may mm -hmm. fly flat on their face or they may, you know, open up a whole new category of hunting style for people. Uh -huh. uh, time will tell, but you know, I'm, I'm hoping we can get those done by 2024. So like we're always a couple years down the road when we're looking at stuff. Yeah, you know, there's just hurdles. But China's been so difficult. I mean, I don't know. I, I think a lot of companies are going to get out of China just because they're going to have to between the tariffs and the costs and dealing with, you know, all their crazy uh, lockdowns and all that. And I mean, just look at the supply chain, you know, last year, man, you couldn't hardly buy anything. And then look at this year. They're selling last year's inventory they got in like December and January, but the cost is like crazy, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't know. Uh, I mean, something's going to have to change there. And I know that we're working hard on, you know, all kinds of different options and something will shake loose at some point, but I think it's going to be tough on waterfowlers just looking at things through my eyes and what I see Man, I think it's gonna be tough the next couple of years as far as getting stuff, and then stuff's gonna be expensive. Mm -hmm. Well, we're already hearing we're already hearing about you know expecting some sticker shock um, once you know this year's product, especially on full bodied full bodied geese, is is one of the big things that we're hearing. Like you're you're gonna there's gonna be some sticker shock, but when your when your sea container that's coming from Asia has you know quadrupled uh in in cost you know um someone someone's someone's got to to pick up that that increase in cost right so um and it'd be a very poor business model if, if it was the the company that was eating all of that so yeah and i mean that's a low margin item too i mean it's not like there's a huge mark on decoys i mean you know the you're just you're just taking a little fraction of the cost mm -hmm. they're expensive to make and ship and uh you know i mean decoy prices are way up from what they were three years oh, yeah. ago so that's a, a nice little segue in into your partnership with higdon because it, it's really cool because and i didn't really pick it up until i watched a video but uh that was on your website but the fact that you had started the business and the whole idea because and and to quote you, you wanted to get as intimate with the with the ducks as you could. So you wanted to hide the best that you could so that you could get as close to the ducks as you could. Um, and then you you partner up with a with a company like Higdom, which is the absolute opposite. They're trying to draw the ducks in by being visible and and everything, but both companies play off one another um and it and it looks like a, a great relationship um so just you know talk us through how how that how that came to be well i mean my life was crazy i mean i don't know if you guys know what habitat flats is but it's a mm -hmm. it's outfit we actually I think you've heard of it yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, um, you know, I had that going on and Oh, I didn't know that. Oh well, yeah. I'm one of the, uh, founders of Habitat Flat. So okay. I've been since 2000, shoot, 2007, really. Okay. Uh, but 
so I had that and then I had our veterinary clinics and I had Momars and my wife worked for Momars and she'd been on me to sell the company and I kept moving the bar. Like I'd be like, I'll sell it when it gets to this point. And I was mm-hmm. like, I'll sell it I get this. So something had to go. And it was the only thing that I owned outright by myself. And, uh, and I was like, I don't want to sell it to, this was stupid of me in hindsight, but I was like, I don't want to sell it to somebody outside of our community. I don't want to sell it to a private equity company. Right. I want to sell it to somebody inside our community that understands, you know, the value of what we've created and somebody that understands how our community works and all that. And so, you know, I mean, I'm part of with my brother, the Higgins are brothers and, you know, they're, they're guys that, that have been in it for a long, long time. And anyway, we struck a deal and made it work and Mm -hmm. it was so stressful for me in the beginning. I mean, it was horrible. It was literally horrible. And, uh, I, I would totally regretted selling it and had so many horrible nights and all that, but that lasted for maybe, uh, I don't know, it lasted a long time, maybe a year. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I, I, I decided that, uh, you know, I just needed to accept my role and how I could continue to foster in the best way that I could for Momars and the community that we created and try to try to, you know, work with these guys to see my vision for the way that I thought things should operate within their framework and their limitations and, and also their, you know, their capabilities that were outside of what I was willing or able to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, now I'm just happy to be, a part of everything that, you know, they have some great people that I really enjoy interacting with and, uh, and, and they have some great leadership. And so I'm just, uh, it's, it's a good relationship. I'm happy to be involved. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Like if I'll become more involved or or less involved, but, uh, I don't know. I just take it a day at a time. Yeah, Enjoying the ride right now. Right. Oh yeah, it's all good, man. I get to do the fun parts and don't have to worry about thirty-five thousand dollars shipping containers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt, boys. Uh, Phil, you've been you've been really quiet, Philly. So uh, I'll let you. Uh, I'll I'll take a break here. I'll go to the beer fridge, and uh, and you guys go. Well, what's funny? I just had a kid deliver me one. Hmm. I don't have one of those down here. Yeah, I, I text my wife. I'm like, send a beer over. But uh, <laughs> yeah, like, I. Uh, my my actually first introduction to Momarch is I owned one of your fat boys a couple of years ago, well, a long a couple of years ago, probably about seven years now. And being in that boat, hunt like small water, small water, small gauge guns is my passion. And hunting in that boat in small water was just like a complete eye opener. Like it is a layout blind, it's a floating layout blind, for lack of a better term. And I bought a long tail for it and like the places I could go and like just literally having ducks like 10 yards feet, big old fat orange feet down in your face was like an absolute game changer for, for hunting for me. And then yeah, I, I did a stupid thing and sold it, <laughs> which I shouldn't have done, but, um, but yeah, like that, that was an amazing boat. And I, I still, still run some of your products this day, I got, uh, the dog stand, which I actually probably use for dog training more than anything. I don't think it's ever step, step foot in water, unfortunately, but. So, so um, you probably have the final stand, the one that's just the stand. Yeah. It's just the stand. That's it. Yeah. So what I did is I've got the stand, but then I've got another layout blind, like a dog blind that I can put on top if need be. Right. So you kind of, it's, you know, it's, I've made made more use of the stand because I can run the stand on its own. I can run the dog blind on its own, or I can put the dog blind on the stand. Sure. Um, but uh, like that that stand though was like an absolute game. I used to own. I think it was like the rough stand. I was not a fan. 
Um, now that I've yeah. got the more dog stay like such an amazing product for any guys like they're like they're doing dog training because you can use it as like a place stand or if you're hunting small water and you're gonna be standing in the water and you want your dog on something dry like it is hands down the way to go well i know uh this past weekend we were at the uh the ducks unlimited grimsby outdoor festival and and pat hondricks who's uh one of your dealers up here in here in canada here in ontario ira um he showed up and uh that was that was a pretty popular uh product that was going out the door i can tell you that was was the uh was the invisalab there was there was an awful lot of people and and it was pretty smart on on the committee too because they had uh they had uh one of the hunt clubs come out and do a do a thing for their dogs so all of those people showed up over at the outdoor festival after and then when pat had all those dog lines and everything there i think he done all right uh and and managed to sell a few so that was good that was good Good. Yeah, the Invisalab, I don't know. I went to Rogers a couple of weeks ago and we had that, but we, we did not have any final stands there. So mm-hmm. they're, you know, just getting products so tough right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and two totally different products, right? Like the Invisalab and, and the final stand, like two totally different, two totally different products. Um, but two very, very so I've I hunt primarily out of my boat i hardly ever have my dog um in in water but now i'm i have a place where um my dog so i've last year i had my dog in a in a folding lawn chair um in this water with me so uh so i'm in definitely yeah. going to be definitely got to be getting into the the final stand is the one that i'd like to get because it's just it's it's higher and and um just about the height that i need for her so um yeah i'm looking forward to it the invisible will go is high but you know the final stand if you're hunting in tall cover like you know you guys have nothing breeds a lot maybe yeah yeah you know you don't really need the the blind for your dog and that type of deal near as much as you you do if you're in like sheet yeah. water or what we call wrp so moist soil you know flooded quite a weeds and that kind of stuff where you just don't have much of a hide and those ducks would be like, no, no, I, I'm not coming over there. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, but again, like I, I just, when I found out the fact that you were a vet, uh, a veterinarian, I was like, yeah, this makes, this makes sense now. Like, because you know, there's companies out there that's catering to dogs, but, not to the point, not as in innovative as what Momersh has, um, in my opinion, anyways. Um, so it it just makes sense, and and that's you know I think every hunter goes through goes through a point where um, shooting birds is not the most important thing to them every morning. Even though I still enjoy it, don't get me wrong, but my yeah. joy my joy now is is. And and it's not so much joy. What I found out is I like bragging about my dog. I I like I like sending my dog out on on a ridiculous retrieve. Uh, when fellas say uh, we're gonna have to collapse everything and and get the boat out and we're gonna have to go retrieve that bird and and now um, to send my dog and and see her due to these ridiculous retrieves is that's my uh, that's my crack for for lack of a better term these days. Sure. Well, a lot of this comes back to, you know, safety and uh, having a dog that knows what it's supposed to be doing. So whether it's the home cot and you're at home mm-hmm. or a kennel and it's like, hey, you go climb or you go place. And that dog knows, OK, that's my safe spot yeah. Yeah. where I need to be or you're setting, uh, you know, you're setting up a field spread in the dark. And you want to know where your dog is. The first thing mm-hmm. I'm going to do is throw out, throw out my whatever I'm using so that I know my dog's in there. It's not running around, getting going to get hit by a car or any of yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. And then when we're hunting, you know, we don't we want our dogs to be steady. We don't want them to break. That's and right. So if you just have consistent messaging 
all the time, whether you're at your kid's baseball game or at your house or in the field or setting up and you've got a spot for them and it's always there and that's their comfortable place, then that's good for you and that's good for the dog. So we wanted a line of products that always gave the opportunity to the dog to make the right choice to be in a spot where it was safe and you knew where it was and the dog knew that it was doing the right thing and it had a job so it was out of trouble you didn't have to worry about it and that's what really that whole line of products whether you're wherever you are there's something that we have something that's light portable mm-hmm. drinks need it and and your dog can go there and know that that's where it's supposed to be all right, I want to switch. Uh, I want to switch it a little bit because um, I was I was watching your your Instagram, your social media feed the other day, and I was watching you doing some hiking, um, pack on your back, you know, putting in some serious miles, reminding me of my days back in the army. Um, and you had mentioned that you know you're 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 getting into some conditioning because you got you got a big hunt coming up uh, up in the mountains. So uh, you know. Th- I'm not, I'm not going to date you. I'm not going to say anything. I'm 45 years old. Uh, I've done 20 years in the Canadian army and I know what my body is capable of these days and, and it ain't much. Um, so mm-hmm. I couldn't imagine having to, to start the conditioning to do a big hunt up in the mountains. Uh, uh, you know, can, can you walk us through some of your, some of your growing pains? Maybe you're in a lot better shape than me, but, uh, some of your pains going, going through this. Well, I'm 53. Okay. And I've hunted, you know, I mean, I, I, I've killed, uh, uh, caribou with my bow. This is a long time ago. Shoot. That was back in 1995. I'm not a huge bow hunter. I'm I'm really a wing shooter. Mm-hmm. Um, I shot a red stag in New Zealand a couple years ago. But you know that's can hunt. Anyway, I've always wanted to kill an elk, and not with a rifle. I've wanted to go bow hunt, rutting elk during the prime time, and you know the clock's ticking. So it's like okay, I need to do it, and so uh, I decided I decided to do it in the winter. And I paid my money to go with the guide because I've never done it. I, I mm-hmm. don't want to go there and not have a legit, decent chance to at least have an opportunity. So uh, I don't know. I probably started. I probably started trying to get ready fitness wise in like, man, uh, April. Mm-hmm. And so I live I live on a lake, and it's 200 vertical feet from my lake to my house. I say my lake, the lake to my house. So I've been going up and down that thing with a pack on my back mm-hmm. oh and and so you know you can only do so much at 750 feet of altitude when you're going to be hunting at you know nine to eleven thousand feet so yeah uh, i'm gonna yeah so i i feel like my bow's shooting good i'm shooting good uh, i feel like you know uh, the first couple times I went up and down that hill, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> now I go, a pack on my back, you know, and I get done and I'm sweaty and tired. That was what I had just finished doing right before I got on this. And, uh, but at least, I mean, I am, I'm going to be ready to the best of my capability. And if I gut shoot one the first day and it's game over and I got to sit there and mope for four days, well, it'll suck. But at least I'll know that I did my, I did, the best yep. I could do to get ready. Where, That's where we are. Where are you? Where are you going to shoot the elk, Ira? Well, I'm going to Southern Colorado to try to shoot an elk, Colorado, but yeah, yeah, Southern yeah, Colorado. You're, yeah, you're all high altitude and thin air. Yeah, a buddy of mine went there last year, and you know he got lucky to harvest a real big one. I don't, I don't really care about the size. I just want right. to, you know, have a great experience and have a chance at a representative species like you know if i just if i just kill a, a pretty decent one and have a fun and cool and exciting huh that that'll be what i'm that'll be great yeah absolutely like, that's like my dream dream thing is to shoot an elk i've been I dreaming re- about it for 20 years so we're gonna do it this year i could really care less about shooting it i want to be out on that that crisp nor and i've said it on this show a number of times 
Um, I'd like to be out on that crisp fall morning and see one break out of the tree line um, and bugle and and just see the the you know the steam coming out of its mouth that that iconic image that I have. I'm not a I'm not a big game guy. I grew up hunting moose, um, but that that was it. Moose and a little bit of caribou, but um, where I'm from, um, so. Um, but there's no elk. Uh, elk is is something that's totally foreign to me. So uh, I just like to see them. Well, I want to see that, but then I really want to see that steam coming out of his rib cage right after I hit that arrow. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, everybody. Oh, go for it. Well, I was going to say, like, where where my dad deer hunts in Bancroft. We've got elk in that area, and he's been out mm-hmm. here, and he's heard them heard them bugle. Yeah, and just like it, it is an eerie, eerie sound. Oh, it's so loud, right? Yeah. Well, I know their lodge uh, there um, in Yorkton. You know, I know that there's quite a few elk east of there, and and they do. You know, there's some big game hunting around there. I mean, I I know there's elk there, and moose there, and a lot of deer there. Um, but yeah, I know I know Canada's got quite a population of of all that you know all the big yeah. name stuff yeah I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure where i am so i i live on a so i'm not where i live where i'm from originally from i'm from an island off the east coast of of canada called newfoundland and newfoundland has the most moose um per per square kilometer than anywhere else in the world um so to us, I, I say I grew up hunting moose. We we didn't hunt moose because it was just, you know, drive down the road, you see the animal that you wanted and, and you harvested it. There was no hunting. There was no skill involved. Um, so so we really took it for granted when we were growing up and, and stuff. And now um, the population is managed and it's very healthy and, and, it's, and it's managed properly. So, um, but now with the, with the shutdown of, of the, the pulp and paper industry in my province. So all of those cutovers now um, are all grown up. So if you want your moose now, you definitely got to go hunt for it. Uh, so, which is, which is totally foreign to so many of us from back there, because before, you know, I I've told the story on here. I, I remember as a teenager being with my dad uh, waking up in the morning and, and his, his Ford Bronco having a flat tire um, before we could even leave to go hunting, uh, leave the camp. And uh, as he's changing the tire, I said, Dad, there's a moose. And, uh, you know, and and he literally took his gun out of the back of the Bronco, shot the moose, finished clean, changing his tire, and and we went and, and cleaned it and threw it aboard the Bronco and, and came home. You know what I mean? So um, now now these days, and, and when I grew up, Ira, you may not believe this, buddy, but in the wintertime when we would go on snowmobile across the bogs and the marshes, we used to have a major migration of, of, uh, of the woodland caribou that used to come through our town. And we could, we could ride and, and they would just separate like the Red Sea and you could just put your hands out and just rub their backs. And, they, there was, and I mean thousands of them. Uh, but they had no predator in Newfoundland at the time. So their, their, their only predator was the black bear. And that was it. So no wolves, no coyote, no nothing. Um, but in the last 15 to 20 years, there's been the introduction of the coyote. It's come across on the ice um, and that has affected their migration. And now we don't see that migration come through my hometown anymore. So um, it was crazy, crazy growing up because I mean, there was, thousands of them that would come through our our hometown well maybe it'll be like the silhouette decoy and it'll all come (laughs) yeah no doubt go kick trudeau's trudeau in the balls and then uh maybe they'll all well i tell you what why don't we set up a why don't we set up a, a little meeting between biden and trudeau and we can get we can kick both of them in the nuts that old bastard wouldn't even know if you kicked him the nuts. He'd probably be like, oh, what, what, what happened? And I'm not so sure Trudeau even has nuts. So, um, no. no shit. Um, Ira, yeah. buddy, thank you so much for this. Um, we're going to have, we're well over our, our normal time. Um, but um, 
I tell you what, we've got more to talk about. So I'd like to, I'd like to be able to invite you to come back on the show again, especially after your hunt and, and be able to talk about it. And, uh, when, when you go down to Colorado and, and I've got faith, you're, you're, you're totally going to tag out down there. So, uh, I'd love to have you come back on and talk about it, buddy. I really would. We're going to try. And again, sorry, I was late. Uh, no, it's all good. <laughs> Great to talk to you guys. No, thank you so much, Philly. No, absolute pleasure to have you on, Ira. Been a longtime fan of uh, yourself and your products and the company, and just the amazing things you guys put out. And I continue to love watching uh, watching the videos. I actually just watched the one the other day of you trying to shoot a, a barrows, and love love the flooded corn videos, and just keep up the great work. I did shoot a barrows, you know? I got to tell you a quick story. So I shot a barrows, but I was they were like 55 and passing and it was a pair and I shot at the Drake and I killed the hen. Yep. Hey, never um, fails. Yeah. Hen killer. Hen killer. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Ira, thanks so much for coming on, buddy. I really appreciate it. And especially the fact that uh, we messed up the time there and you still managed to come on and, and have a chat with us. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Union 0430. We are not, nor will we ever pretend to be a bunch of experts. We are merely a bunch of friends that love one another's company, and we love chatting, waterfowl, hunting, whatever it is. So um, thanks to Ira McCauley from Mo Marsh for coming on tonight. Um, right in the middle, and he saved the day because me, Phil, and Ryan were really struggling here. So, Ira, thanks so much for coming on, buddy. Uh, really appreciate it, and can't wait to have you back on the show again sometime. Thanks a lot, fellas. Okay. Big love, everybody. <laughs>